This is part two of lecture 13 of Logika Uratronanishtvu, Logic in Computer Science. In the first part, we looked at uh, dependent type theory, which we saw was a powerful language for defining types, a bit like sets, um, with types of different kinds of structures, as in particular functions and products, and we had um, dependent functions and dependent products as the powerful constructions. And, um, and we also saw how that naturally incorporates both propositional and first order logic. And we were more or less following the syntax of the Lean Theorem Prover, which is um, a currently very uh, well supported and um, so becoming very established uh, proof assistant to allow people to construct mathematical theories, independent type theory, and and um, prove theorems. So we're going to see just a, a glimpse at Lean today. We're going to have a, a little brief look at um, proving some simple theorems. And uh, as you know, there's an optional exercise um, an optional homework for you to do uh, over the next week and a bit, which uh, if you want to, then that will give you some experience of theorem proving in Lean, and you can earn yourself 10% um, towards your final course mark if you do this exercise. Right, so we're going to use Lean. Um, installing Lean is... Uh, can be a bit of a process. Uh, so I've got a Mac, I, inst I, I install it on, on my Mac and you have to configure um, an editor to, to work with it. Um, probably most of you will use VS Code, which is uh, a Microsoft editor, um, a very apparently nice modern editor that you can use with Lean. Um, so Good luck to you if you do that. I think it will probably have many advantages. Um, I'm instead using Emacs because, which is the other option for, for, for of an editor for using with Lean. I hope it won't make too much difference which editor one uses, but what I'm going to show you is Lean working in Emacs. I'm using Emacs because I already had Emacs installed on my Mac and it is one of the editors I routinely use. Um, so here's my Emacs window, and in it we have a file, and this is a lean file, so it's called activelecture.lean because active because this is the file I want to actually use while I'm um, recording the lecture. Of course, the dot lean um, suffix at the end means that this is a lean file, and it's written in the in the syntax of lean. So we've got various things in dependent type theory. We'll go through not everything in this file, but, but some of them. Notice that Emacs has recognized that I'm using lean. So, so that was why I need, why you need to configure your editor so that it recognizes that you're using, using lean and that it can run lean in the background on the code, on the um, lean code that you're editing. And here, this zero bar two, means that I have zero errors in this file, that's the first zero, but there are two comments. And there are two comments, these are these comments are where there's the red part, um, sorry, that's that's what I've written, the sorry, and it's not a, not a lean comment itself, but you notice that the theorem here has a red dotted underline there, and the comment there, there you, you can see it says the declaration for this theorem um, prop S is the name of the theorem. You can see that in blue and you can see that in the pop-up window. Well, it's, if you hover too long, the message seems to go away. But this declaration uses sorry. And what that means is this is a theorem that I haven't given the proof for. So I'm just saying we, we, I'm claiming this is true, but I haven't actually proved it yet. And there's another sorry um, down further down, which is, and these are both proofs that we are going to fill in during the lecture. So let's just start at the top. Um, we've got a namespace. Well, that's the, that's, I'm just declaring that everything in here 
is going to be seen by the outside world as being tagged as belonging to LVR dash lecture. So that's a namespace, standard computer science concept of a namespace. Um, and I've got a theorem. So I'm stating a theorem that I'm giving a name to. So the name is prop S. I'll tell you the reason for the S a little bit later. And this is simply a theorem in propositional logic that if I go to my notes, I'm going to write here. So it's simply the theorem that if you have P implies Q implies R, that that implies P implies Q implies P implies R. And as I hopefully already said at the beginning of the course, though I'm not sure whether I did, in propositional logic and particularly in type theory, if you have a bunch of implications like this and you don't have brackets, unlike most operations like sum and product and, well, most operations you use which associate to the left, the implication or the function space arrow it's, it's more helpful if it associates to the right. So in blue, I'm writing the implicit brackets here that didn't need to be written because these are auto, it's automatically parsed in this way. But really, we're proving this implication here, from, but from this implication to this implication. Anyway, it's bracketed like this, and I'm going to show you the proof in lean. But before we do that, let's remind ourselves of how we would prove this in natural deduction. So, because the proof in lean is going to be very similar. So the proof in natural deduction Well, we're proving an implication, so in line one, we assume P, sorry, we assume the left-hand side of the implication, which, actually, which, is, which is actually P implies Q implies R. Um, sorry, we, we write it like this in natural deduction. I'm getting too, uh, I'm getting too influenced by having been using lean. So we write the, the formula here. And then our justification here, so this is an assumption. So we've assumed this, and we want to prove then, based on that assumption, we want to prove an implication. So again, we assume the left-hand side of the implication. So that's now P implies R. Notice I'm not going to bother with the unnecessary brackets now. Having explained how it's bracketed once, I, I can just write it naturally without the brackets. So now we've made this assumption too. And now we want to still prove another implication, which is P implies R. So to prove that, we're going to assume P. So sorry, this we should justify as an assumption. And again, we're going to assume P, so we justify that as an assumption. Well, and now from this, what we want to derive, we had assumed P implies Q implies R. We've assumed P implies, oh, I've made a mistake there, probably. Hopefully many of you spotted that. I should have written P implies Q there. We've assumed the first antecedent, that's left-hand side of the implication. We've assumed the second left-hand side of the implication, that's P implies Q, and the third antecedent of the implication, that's P. So that should have been P implies Q. Um, and we want to get, we've, having assumed that, we want to prove R. And then we're going to discharge all the assumptions. So, how do we prove R? Well, we've got P implies Q and P, so we can get Q by implies elimination or modus ponens, as it's also called. So we get Q, so this was applies elimination on two and three. And we've got, um, Or oh, maybe I'm going to do things in a different order. Sorry for that. I mean, we can indeed get Q, but having got P, we can also get Q implies R. 
Of course, it doesn't matter what order you do them, um, as long as everything, as long as you get to the result in the end. Um, so we can get Q implies R by implies elimination on one and three, because this is P implies, and remember it's bracketed like that, and we've got P. We can similarly get Q by implies elimination on two and three. That's the step that I already wrote down before. And having done that, we can get R because we've got Q implies R and Q. So we do another applies elimination on um, four and five. So that gives us step six. So we get R implies elimination on four and five. And then we want to get P implies Q implies R implies P implies Q implies P implies R. So we bring in the, we use the, the uh, implies introduction three times. So we have three steps. Now, first we get um, P implies R. So this is implies introduction on um, three to six. Let me draw the box around. So P, the assumption P is now discharged. Then we bring in P implies Q. So we get P implies Q implies P implies R, again by implies elimination, introduction, sorry, on two to seven now. And uh, so that puts a box around all that and we've discharged another assumption. And finally we do another implies elimination on the whole proof and we get the theorem we want P implies Q implies R, implies P implies Q, implies P implies R. So that's implies elimination on one to eight. Right, so here we go. Now we've discharged all the assumptions and so we indeed have this as a theorem. So let's go to lean in my Emacs window. So first the statement of the theorem, well we've given it the name, prop s, as I said, and it's this, the syntax is um, as we would expect. Um, this arrow here, we could actually write that in ASCII, so using the just the typewriter keyboard as arrow as a, as a dash greater than, so that's the usual ASCII notation for an arrow, but um, but the editors have nice a nice nice math characters interface, so you can actually instead use the arrow symbol by, I don't th think you saw what I wrote there, it's backslash T-O, backslash two, and that draws, and that draws a nice arrow for you. So P implies Q implies R, implies P implies Q implies P implies R for where P, Q and R, well this is propositional logic, so P, Q and R are propositions. So remember we have this, um, we have these special types called propositions and we declare something to be a proposition by saying P colon prop. So this is a way of saying P colon prop, Q colon prop and R colon prop all together. And this curly brackets here means that Well, if we were ever using a proof of this, then it would infer, then, um, then lean would infer P, Q and R for us. We don't need to give it explicitly. Actually, we're not going to use that, that, that here. Um, so for, for our purposes, we're not going to see that in this case. We'll see other uses of that later. So maybe I'll explain that better when we, when we use it. For our purposes, this is, this is just saying that we're declaring here that P, Q and R for any propositions, P, Q and R, this holds. And we want to give a proof of this. So we've 
So to give the proof, we've got P, Q and R to deal with. And I've written sorry, which is we don't have a proof at the moment. But of course, um, we want to give a proof. So instead of sorry, I'm going to give the proof. And we shall see that this proof looks rather nice. So, so we're going to assume P implies Q implies R. So P slash 2 Q slash 2 R. But instead of just assuming a proposition, as we do in the natural deduction proof, uh, in the natural deduction proof, if we go to it um, here, in the natural deduction proof, everything is on a line. So we have line numbers so we can refer to propositions later on, which we're doing all the time. So in lean, we don't, we're not going to have line numbers. Sorry, I'm going to the wrong window there. We're not going to have line numbers, but instead, you can think of this as giving it a name for this assumption. So we say, assume F. So we you can think of this as giving it, giving it a name, but the correct way of thinking it is, of thinking about it is this. I mean, it's not, it's not misleading to think of it as a, as a name, not totally. We're going to use it a bit like that, but the correct way of thinking about it is we're assuming that P implies Q implies R, that's a proposition is true. As I talked about in the theoretical part of the lecture, a proposition being true means that the type, that is that proposition, is inhabited, has, has some element. That's exactly what truth of a proposition means. So to say we assume it's true, we assume that it has some element. And we're going to say, we're, so we're assuming that we have some element F of the type P implies Q implies R. And likewise with the other assumptions, we're going to similarly assume we have some element G of the type P implies Q, E slash 2Q. And we're going to assume It doesn't like that because I forgot the comma that separates the assumptions. So let's separate things by assumptions. And um, su assume x. Okay, so we've, we've made exactly the same three assumptions as in the, as in the natural deduction proof. And notice the theorem is still underlined and it's saying it still uses sorry. I haven't got sorry written there, but what that means is that um, Lean is trying to process the, the file, process the proof as we go along. And if it uses sorry, it means we have not yet completed the argument. So what we're aiming for is for this red dotted line here to go away. So we haven't completed the argument and that's not surprising because we know what we're trying to do. We've got our proof here. We've made these three assumptions. We now want to do the three um, implies eliminations. Now notice we've, if I write out the names here that we've given, or rather the names we've given to the elements of the proposition. So here we've got F, here we've got G, and here we've got X. So here we want to do, the first thing we want to do is and eliminate, sorry, implies elimination to one and three. So that's implies elimination with F and X. But if you remember the lecture, implication is just function space. So here P implies Q implies R, is really the type of functions from P to functions from Q to R. So F is a function from P, from type P, to which if we apply F to a, an element of type P, will give us a function from Q to R. So 
The way of doing an implies elimination is simply to apply this function f to an element of p, to the proof we have of p. Implies elimination, we have a proof of the implication from p, and we have a proof of p. You simply apply the function f to the element of p. So here, the, the element we're going to get of q implies r is f of x. So we're just going to begin our proof by say, begin sorry continue our proof by saying uh, if we go back to Emacs so we simply continue f x and if we go back well we can just work here so we now f of x as we as we saw you can go back on the video if you like but f of x is now an element of type q arrows r so we need to apply it to an element of q but we can get an element of q by applying g to x because g is a function from p to q and x is an element of p so i need to get my brackets from the keyboard viewer so, so here we're simply going to apply this to g applied to x. And having done that, the dotted line has gone away and as far as lean is concerned, we have finished the proof. So, let, so here this mysterious expression fx gx, let's go back to the notes. So here we obtained q by um, implies elimination on 2 and 3. So again, that's applying the function from P, at P to Q to the element X of type P. So here we get an element G of X of type Q. And then we do implies elimination on 4. That's the function from Q to R to and five, that's the element of Q. So we need to apply the function fx, which is a function, so f was a function from P to Q to R, fx is a function from Q to R, gx is an element of Q, so we need to apply fx to the element gx. So we can't simply write fx gx, because then it would try to apply f first to x, and then apply that to g, and then apply the result of that to x, and that wouldn't work, because the, the types are wrong for that. Um, so it needs to be bracketed like this. We're applying f of x to g of x, and that gives us an element of r. And this is exactly the expression we've got in the proof. Notice we don't need to do the implies introductions here. And that is because lean is clever. So lean, as you may know, the English word means slim. Um, so lean, one way in which lean is lean is it allows one to give proofs without too much cumbersome notation. Um, if we go back to here, so here we've got a proof of R, and essentially when we say assume, in this case, it already knows in the context that we're using it here that we're assuming this to get a proof of an implication whose antecedent is P implies Q implies R, then we're assuming this Part to get a proof of the antecedent whose who's, um, a proof of an implication whose antecedent is P implies Q and here we're assuming X to give we're assuming P to get a proof of an implication whose antecedent is P so once we've then got the resulting R essentially it's completely automatic that we've completed a proof of this implication so there's no real reason for a proof system to have to contain that additional part of these um, of these introduction rules of separated from the assumptions. In a sense, the assumptions are part of the introduction rules and um, making writing the proof down like this is enough to complete the proof. Okay, so it's actually quite painless to, well, it's taken a long time to talk through it, of course, but this is the first time we've seen a proof in Lean. Um, it's not that painful to give a proof, translate a proof by natural deduction into a proof by lean, a proof in lean. Um, 
And this colon equals is saying, well, here we're defining an element that we're calling prop s of this type. Actually, it needs to be given p, q, and, and r as arguments, these propositions as arguments, but those can often be left implicit, hence the curly brackets, more of which later. Um, so prop, we're defining a, an element prop s that has this type, and that element is, so the, the colon equal is saying we're defining this element prop s to be um, this, made, made from these assumptions. Now remember, propositions are just special cases of types. So here's another version of the same theorem, which is actually more general. And, and here we're proving for any type A, B, C, we're constructing an element type underscore S of type A arrows, B arrows, C, arrows, A arrows, B, arrows, A, arrows, C. So notice this is exactly the same implication, so to speak, only I'm now using capital A's, B's and C's to emphasize that we're working with types. That's more general than working with propositions. So we now think of A, B, C as sets, and we're not therefore, in this case, proving that something is true. We're constructing an element of a set, and this set is a function space. It's a function space um, from func that takes functions from A to B to C and maps them to functions that map functions from A to B to functions from A to C. So it's a bit of a mouthful, but anyway, it's a sort of iterated, well, it's not a sort of, it is literally an iterated function space construction. And uh, if you remember the go back to the lecture notes, um, here we are, we go back to functions. So the arrow constructor was a special case of the dependent product constructor. Um, must be somewhere, here we are. And we have the two ways of dealing with dependent, the two, the introduction and elimination rules for dependent products. So arrow is just a special case. We have the same rules for, for, um, for, uh, for arrow. So if we, if we have, so in this case, let's maybe write this in, um, let's write this in green, dark green. Or, so a special case would be here if we have f from a to b and e to a, we get f of b e in b. Notice that function application is you just stick the function next to its argument. We've already been using this notation because in the proof of in the propositional logic proof we already used this. And the special case here for um, for the introduction rule, let's give ourselves a bit more space, is that in order to prove, to construct an element of function type A arrows B, we assume some X in A, we derive some E in B, and then that gives us then a function lambda X dot, lambda X colon A E, of type A arrows B. So all these, these are special cases for arrows. Let's get rid of this um, keyboard viewer. Okay. So we go back to, well, maybe I should have kept that, but it doesn't matter. I think having seen it once, that's enough. Um, if we go back to 
to lean. We notice that here, to prove this theorem, it's exactly the same as the proof we had above, except the P's, Q's and R's have changed to A's, B's and C's, except I've used lambdas instead of assumes, because rather than assuming that a rather than rather than assuming that a proposition is true and therefore has an inhabitant F, we're considering the function that maps an element F of type A to B to C. And that function is then given by this, which is then the function that maps G to um, to all this, and then this, uh, and then this is the, the function that maps x to f of x, g of x, etc. So let me just write that down. Um, so lambda notation. Let's keep in green. Or maybe no, we'll put it back in blue because that's what we were writing in. So lambda notation. So that's the proof in lean is lambda f from well in this case let's keep it with p implies q implies r in the in the um, in the case of the so this is the proof for the propositional case in the non-propositional case we have a b and c here for the general types um, lambda G P implies Q lambda X in P and then F X G X. So this is the whole proof as a lambda term. It's the element of the type of of this type. And it's also then, if we change it to A's, B and C's, it's the element of the type where we replace this with A's, B's and C's. And we go back to, uh, to lean here. And so we just write it down. It's exactly the same as before, except we've replaced assume with lambdas. And in fact, assume is just another word for lambda. So this, from the purposes of lean, this is just the same, exactly the same proof as this proof. Just somehow it's natural to use assume when you're reasoning with proposition, with propositions, when you're reasoning logically. And here we're, it's natural to use lambda because here we're really dealing with functions on sets. So let's see that we can actually use this, um, we, can, we can actually use this function. So we essentially here what we've done is we've defined a function type s, that's its name, of this type. So this, so it's a family of functions for any types a, b and c, one gets a function that has that that has this type. It takes one function as an, uh, f as an argument, another function g as an argument, an element x as an argument and returns a value of type c. Okay, so let so let's actually see that we can use such functions. So this is an example. Although we started off with a propositional proof, by seeing that propositional proof as an instance of a more general showing constructing an element of a type, we've actually constructed a useful function in mathematics, if you like. I mean, a potentially useful function that one could use to define other functions in mathematics. For those of you who have seen some lambda calculus before, um, I've called it S because this function is actually very famous in lambda calculus. It's called the S combinator. Um, anyway, it's a, so this is a, a function that we can define using lambdas and applications. And to show you how we can compute in, in lean, as I said, one of the advantages of lean, when I was talking about the, the advantages that lean has as a independent type theory has as a theorem proving environment is that you can actually compute with the things that you define. So to do that, let's define some interesting functions and lean has an inbuilt type of natural numbers that's written nicely using the mathematical blackboard notation for the natural numbers. You write backslash or sorry, forward slash, um, 
let me check whether it's forward slash. I'm getting a bit confused now. Let's, let's see if it's back. So let's try forward slash. No, it must be backslash. So this shows you how you write it, except that it should be backslash and it's then it's nat with all lowercase. So if we write, there we go. And then we get to nice natural numbers. Um, so this was two, the, the arrow here. So we're going to define a function on natural numbers that's a takes two arguments. One or two, it takes the arguments one at a time and then returns a natural number. I'm going to call it sum because it's simply the addition function. So actually, lean has the addition function built in for us. So it's a bit of a pointless thing to do, but just in order to have a function of the right type to illustrate this, I'm showing how we could how we could define the addition function almost from first principles. I mean, it's from first principles in that in order to define it, we need the successor function that returns the successor. Um, returns n plus 1 for any natural number n. So from the successor function plus 1, we can define general sum. We don't need to in lean because it's defined for us, but anyway, I'm illustrating here how one can make definitions. So here we're defining a function on the natural numbers that takes two arguments. So normally to make a definition, we would also do that its name is going to be sum, and we would also do colon equals to say that we're defining it to be this. But lean has a nice facility for allowing us if we, to define functions, to define them by what's called pattern matching in computer science on the arguments, which means we give different cases depending on what the arguments, what the two arguments here, we've got a function that takes two, two natural numbers, so it's got two arguments, and depending on what the arguments are, it's going to do different things. And if we want to define a function by pattern matching, then after the colon here, it needs to be a function. So we, so we expect to have something of function type, expecting number of arguments. You then use the vertical bar and you say, um, normally I would align that actually to the left. So you would say, so you say, this is the case when we're given as the first argument, any number n, m at all, and the second argument is zero. So in the case that the second argument of a sum is zero, and at this point, we use the colon equals to say we're defining this case to have the value. So m plus 0 is m, of course, and m plus the successor of a number n is, of course, the successor of the sum of those two numbers. So this is a nice, well, a simple recursive definition of the sum function. Uh, you wouldn't want to compute this in practice on a large number, but um, anyway... For our purposes, this is a perfectly good logical definition of, uh, of a function on the natural numbers, and it exhibits a standard pattern for defining functions on the natural numbers where we give a case for how it works on zero, and we give a case for how it works on, on a number greater than zero, and that last case is done recursively in terms of the same function we're defining on smaller values of n. So here, n. So here, the second argument on the right is n, whereas on the left it's n plus 1. So we're defining the sum of m and n plus 1 recursively in terms of what the sum function does on smaller values. This is called a definition by primitive recursion. Um, it doesn't matter too much what it's called. It's As a program, one can perfectly easily understand this. And I'm defining another function here that just takes one argument. So it has a type that just takes one argument, natural number to natural number. This is the double function. Um, so as before, we're defining this in a very primitive way. The double of, so twice zero is zero, and twice of the successor, n of a successor value n plus one. Well, we can record, we can calculate that by recursively calculating twice on the smaller argument n instead of n plus 1, and then now we need to add 2. And having done this, we can, so we've, the point is here I've given myself two concrete functions, a sum that is a two argument function, there's a function that takes two arguments from natural numbers to natural numbers to natural numbers, and a function twice that takes one argument from natural numbers to natural numbers. So if we go back to our S combinator, if we instantiate a, b, and c, 
So these are any types at all, so we can instantiate them all as being the natural numbers. Then type s will, if we give it a function from n to n to n, and another function from n to n, and we give it um, a number, we apply it to it, it will give us a number back. So we need to apply type s to a two-argument function. So here I'm going to, I'm applying type s to the two-argument function sum, a one-argument function, that's twice, and a specific number seven. And the hash reduce tells lean to compute. So as I say, these definitions can be computed. It tells lean to, when you define functions in lean, you can compute with them. This tells lean to compute the value of this. Um, so what we're computing is, so, so s is, f is sum. So we're computing the sum of seven and in brackets twice seven. So that's the sum of seven and 14. So if we do this, we should get 21. And if we hover our mouse over the hash reduce, it does the calculation for us. And indeed we get the answer 21. So it's not a thrilling calculation. It's not going to change the world, but it illustrates some simple definitions of functions. How, what we've seen so far is simple definitions of functions, how lean calculates with them and how proper, how we have functions on types generalizing natural deduction proofs in unpropositional logic. So I've also got then a few proofs here. Um, so another proof in propositional logic of uh, a distribution law that AND distributes over disjunction. So again, for three propositions, P and Q or R implies P and Q or P and R. This is the kind of exercise we were proving in natural deduction earlier on in the course. I don't want to talk through everything in this file in the lecture, so what I invite you to do is to give a natural deduction, or revisit if you like, if you've already got one, I may, might have even done it in the lecture, look at a natural deduction proof for this implication and then compare it to the lean syntax for writing such a proof. And again, you will see that the lean syntax is rather a nice syntax for writing such proofs. It's rather similar to the natural deduction syntax, um, but we don't have to do all these explicit introduction rules um, at the end. There's only one at the end here for the, um, for the implication, but we don't need to do that because again, that's incorporated within the assume here. Okay, so that's the, that's the next theorem. Um, We've got a theorem prop for Frobenius, which um, is now in predicate logic. So in predicate logic, um, let me go here. We've got the, this is again, one of the theorems that we might have pr proved using natural deduction, that if we have any proposition P and we have or any formula P if you like, and we've got the statement P and there exists an X such that Q of X, then we can pull that existential statement out to the outside and we can show that there exists an X such that P and Q of X. So here Q is a predicate that takes an argument X and A is if you like the universe of quantification um, in predicate logic. Because we're in type theory, and we, we, we saw that, essentially, you don't have one single universe of quantification, but when you have an, an existential or a universal quantification, you are quantifying over the elements of a type. So in type theory, this says, if P and there exists an element X of type A such that Q holds of X, then, that's the implication, then indeed there exists an X of type A such that for that element x, both p holds and q holds of the element x. So it's very intuitive, um, but in natural deduction, in predicate logic, one needs to give a proof of it, and one can write down the proof, and one can see that the proof 
And then well, you can then compare the proof to the lean syntax, which again, I'm going to leave you to do offline. I don't want to go through all the details of all these proofs in the lecture. Um, just to say a little bit about the left-hand side here. So in propositional logic, we were simply saying P, Q, and R are propositions. In this case, P is a proposition, but Q here, we want it to be a predicate that applies to elements of type A. So what is a predicate? Well, a predicate is a function from type A to propositions. So a predicate is um, saying, it's, a, it's stating a property, give me an element X of A and I will, and I will tell you Q of X says, well, I am a property that I am either true for the element X of A or I am false for the element X of A. So, um, so predicates are functions from the type that they act on to truth values. So that's how we incorporate predicate logic by declaring predicates in this way. And if it was, were a predicate with two arguments, we would give it A arrows, A arrows, prop. So here A needs to be a type for this to make sense. So this is a, the general form of this, what's called, what is sometimes called the Frobenius property um, of conjunction and existential quantification. And then there's another theorem here, some product, which is, so these two theorems that we've just been through were in logic. Some product is again, then rather than applying to logic, we get we defining a function acting on types. And this is saying whenever we have a, a type C depending on an element of A, so one can Define that by saying C takes an element of A and returns a type. Then functions out of the sum over the the, de, the, de, the depend, dependent sum over the x in A um, from so the dependent sum of x in A to C x functions out of that can be mapped to elements so functions in the product that are from the dependent product of x in A to this type. I'm going to leave you to think about that as well offline. Um, it's an interesting principle to think about in terms of understanding the sigma, that's the dependent sum type constructor, and the pi, that's the dependent product type constructor. In fact, there's also an arrow in the other direction. In fact, these, are, these types are a rice it should be isomorphic um, and for those of you who know a little bit of, of category theory here we can think of this as the co-product of the C types indexed by the X's in A and the when we put this as an isomorphism this is stating the universal property of the co-product in that to give a map out of a coproduct is the same thing as to give a family of maps from the components of the coproduct into a common target space, target object. Okay, that was that I realized was an advanced comment that's only intended for those people who know some category theory and are interested in hearing these advanced comments. Um, so now, now, so I invite everyone to look at this type and try to understand this proof but what's really important for the course is now to do the next bit and this is going to help hopefully with your homework so now for everyone who found the last part a little bit um, at, a, at a high level and a little bit fast we're now you can now pause if you like take a breath or something pause the video or come back to it or whatever but we're now going to go uh, back to something um, a bit more elementary, perhaps a bit more fundamental, well, sorry, not more fundamental, but anyway, something that's going to be useful for doing the, um, doing the homework exercise and is a little bit more concerned with reasoning that's relevant 
directly to computer science. So what we're going to do is we've got this powerful language for types and we're going to see how we can, this is something I didn't cover in the, le in the first part of the lecture, but we're going to see how we can use this powerful language in a way we haven't used yet to actually define interesting data type constructors in Lean. And so here, what we're doing using this inductive um, statement in Lean is this is saying we're defining a new type constructor that we're calling list. In fact, Lean has its own built-in lists, but because I'm working in the namespace um, that defined at the top at the top of the file, uh, our lists are, are kept separate from the Lean list, so we can define our own lists to see how they work. We're defining the data type of lists that contain elements of type A. So maybe let's just go to the notes. So uh, let's let's use black. list n would be lists whose elements are natural numbers. And our notation is going to be things like, so we're going to have cons 0 cons 1, nil. That would be an example. And that is, that would be our notation for the list. So cons is like the list constructor, that would be our notation for the list 0, 1, or just nil itself. That would be our notation for the empty list. Um, and we can have list of any type. So we could also have list of list of n. I think it needs to be bracketed in this way. I'm sure it needs to be bracketed in this way. Um, so an example of that would be uh, cons cons 3 nil nil. And that would be the list that contains one list in it that has just the element 3. So this is uh, lists whose elements are there. So this is lists whose elements are lists of natural numbers. Um, so another example would be nil. Um, but we also have cons nil nil, which is the so this is the empty list and this is the list that contains one element that is the empty list. You may remember when we did the um, DPLL SAT solving algorithm, the distinction between the empty list and the list that contains the empty list was very important uh, because. One of them is a true clause, and one of them is a false clause. I'll let you figure out which is which, or remember. So, having seen that, we can we see that um, a list. So a list is either so it's either nil, it's either the empty list, or the two possibilities for list, or it's well, let's so or it's or it's a non-empty list. So a list of type 
list A, where A is a type, is either it's either nil, or it's a non-empty list, in which case it needs to be built using the list constructor. Ooh. Oh my goodness. Uh, how can I how can I get rid of that? So, so it's either so it's either nil, it's either the empty list, or the list is of the form cons a l, where a is an element of type a. So it's a list whose first element is an element of type A and that continues as the tail list where L is a tail list. So that also needs to be a list of elements of type A. So these are the principles for building up all lists. They're, all lists are built by starting with the empty list and consing a finite number of elements onto the empty list. And you need to do that a, a finite number of times to, to build a list. Um, so we can define the type of lists of, t of elements of type A to be the type that is the least type, if you like, the smallest type we can get that contains nil and gives us the possibility whenever we have an element of type A and a list that we've already built from our list type, we can form a new list by consing the element of A to the list that we've already got. So we want kind of the least type we can get from this nil constant, the empty list, and, these, and this cons constructor. And that's what this inductive definition does for us in, um, in Lean. So if we go back to the inductive definition here. Um, here we are. So it's saying that a list, we want to give it, we want to give the list constructor the argument A, which is a type. Given this, it will give us back for any type A, we're going, we're going to have a type list A. And the type list A is the smallest type that we can build a list. So again, notice we've got this um, We've, we've got this bar for the, giving us a case distinction. So we can either build a list using the constant, which is the empty list, nil, or we can, or we can use a constructor, which we're calling cons, and that is a function that we give two arguments to. The first argument is an element of type A, the second argument is list, and it gives us back a list. And in all cases, we're talking about lists of type A. Um, which is the assumed type we've got left of the colon here. So for any type A, we, get, we have a list of, of li we have the type list A, but we can leave the A implicit. Um, and it's the smallest type constructed in this way. And now I'm opening the namespace list to avoid conflict with the list library that, well, actually, now we've, we've already got that avoidance of conflict because we're working in our Logica Vorratul Naunisht namespace, um, but we want to be able to use nil and cons just without calling them list.nil and list.cons. So if we didn't open the namespace, we would not be able to do that. And um, I'm showing now how once we have an inductive definition, we can define functions, again, in a similar way to be defined on the natural numbers by making the case distinctions on the, um, the case distinction on the constructors we've got, on the, so the nil and the, the constants and constructors we've got, and telling us what to do in this case and defining functions recursively. So here's a function that, the length function that for any type A will we, we, the length function is defined on lists of any type A, and for any list of 
elements of type A, it returns a natural number, and the idea is that natural number is the length of the list. So that's defined very easily, just using natural programming style that the length of the empty list is zero and whenever you've and we're defining length by recursion so whenever we cons a new element a onto the head of the list a's that's the tail list then the length of the constructed list that has a on the front is well it's simply of course we take the list recursively of the tail list the length recursively of the tail list and we simply add one to that. Okay, so a simple recursive definition, but the point is these inductive definitions of types allow us to give such recursive definitions. So that's one recursive definition, and I'm defining two recursive definitions on lists. So the other one is the what's sometimes called the append function or the concat function that allows us to concatenate two lists together. So maybe if we go back to uh, the notes. So concaten so where it so concatenation for example of zero one two with two three four this would be the list 0, 1, 2, 2, 3, 4. I deliberately repeated the two just to emphasize that the number of times an element occurs is important in a list, um, and also the order things occur in. Here I'm using the convenient notation that you simply, the, the first element of the list you've constructed, of the, the, of the resulting list is the first element of the first list. If it has one, you go through all the elements of the first list, and then you put in order and then you put in the elements of the second list in order. So that's the concatenate function. Um, so again, we can define this by recursion. It's, now it's a function that takes expects two lists, both of type, both of elements of type A, and we get back a, a list of elements of type A as well. Um, so in the case. So we're going to define this again by a case distinction pattern matching on the possibilities for the first argument. So if we apply the concatenation to a pair of lists where the first list is empty and the second list is any list of Bs, well, if we concatenate the empty list onto a list, we, onto, a, on, onto an interesting list of Bs, we get back the interesting list of Bs. And if we concatenate a a more interesting list onto the front of a list of Bs, so a list that begins with an element little a and continues with the tail a's, well then our concatenated list needs to begin with the element a, and its tail is what we get by recursively concatenating um, recursively concatenating a onto the concatenation, sorry, recursively consing a onto the, well sorry, consing a onto what we get by recursively calculating the concatenation on the A's and the B's. Okay. And um, there's, there's, there's a similar definition in the homework file. And there, there are some examples, I think, that you can, we can do the, um, so, one, so one could do hash reduce and some examples to see that um, in action. Uh, Maybe we should do that. Um, yes, let's let's do that. I think we've got. It's not going to take very long. Uh, so, um, I'm just trying to find the right place now. Uh, so we've done concatenation. So let's do. Um, I need my keyboard back. Let's do hash reduce. And what we get from concatenating the list that contains, um, say, three, then two. So that's cons 
three. Cons two nil. And we're going to concatenate that onto the list that contains just the element one. And of course, we'll get from that the list that contains three, then two, then one, at least. Hopefully we should, and there we do. So cons three, cons two, cons one, nil. So indeed that is the list, three, two, one. Okay, so I'll leave that in, because now I want to come to the main thing we're going to do, is that what we've been doing so far is, um, well, we've proved some simple theorems at the start, but we've been separating, actually, um, we've been doing two kinds of things. We've either, either been proving theorems, or we've been giving definitions of um, mainly functions, but in general one defines an element of a type. Um, so in fact here this concat, con, well in this reduced to cons 3, cons 2, cons 1, cons 1, nil, which is an element, so this is defining an element of a type that's not a function, namely an element of the type list of natural numbers. So we've been defining elements of types, some like list of natural numbers, also we gave specific natural numbers, um, but a lot of the elements we've been defining have been functions. We've also stated theorems and proved them. In fact, there's no real distinction in lean between the two, because when you prove a theorem, the theorem is actually a type by the propositions as types. It's a proposition. This is a proposition here involving the equality, the equality type. Um, but every proposition is a type, and to prove it, we define, what we do is we need to give a proof, and we need, and giving a proof means we define an element of that type. So here the element is going to be called length concat. But still it's useful, so there's real, no real distinction between def, which is definition and theorem in lean, but for a human user it's convenient to separate things into definitions and theorems. So Definitions are often computational in nature, like these are. And here this is a theorem that's really, so theorems tend to have propositions, that you're stating a proposition, it's either true or false. Um, so here we're stating, what I want to illustrate is that using the logic of lean, we can actually prove interesting theorems um, about what we're defining. Of course, we're going to have a very simple example, but um, we have a, it actually turns out that lean has a very powerful, the type theory of lean is very powerful, and people are really using lean to do um, research level mathematics nowadays. So one can do very powerful things. What we're going to prove is this theorem, which I call length concat, which says for any type A, the following colon, then the following statement is true. And that statement is, whenever we have two lists of type A, so I'm calling them a list of A's and a list of B's, then if we concatenate those two lists, so we put the A's before the B's, and work out what the length of that is, then that's the what the result of that is, is simply the sum of the lengths of the two lists. Okay, so I guess you can see that's true. We've stuck the list of A's side by side to the list with the list of B's. Um, so the length of the resulting list is indeed, of course, the sum of the two lists, component lists from which it was formed. But nonetheless, this is a mathematical statement and we're going to actually give it a rigorous proof of this. Okay, we can see it in our heads, but how can we actually prove rigorously that this is true. And basically when you prove statements about lists or natural numbers, which are also defined by induction, the natural numbers are the smallest type that contain zero and are closed under the successor operation. Lists are the smallest type that contain nil and are closed under the cons operation. Um, so in order to prove theorems about lists, in this case, or natural numbers, one proves by induction. So we are going to prove this theorem by induction. Okay. 
So in fact, you've already seen the proof of this theorem because I inadvertently copied it from my clipboard into the in, in, into the board I was I was writing on with with my pen earlier. So there was a brief glimpse at it earlier, but anyway, we're going to um, work this out from scratch. So here I've started with um, the redefining the the length concat to be equal to the the value we're given. That's a standard way of starting a proof. We need to give then we need to then give define an element of this type, which will be the proof. But in this case, because we're proving a result about A's and B's, which are lists, now this is um, a for all, which is a dependent product. So our proof is going to take the A's and B's as an argument. So in fact, what we're going to use is the same splitting this into a case distinction for the different possibilities we can have for the A's and the B's. And it's natural to do this because our concatenation function and our length function were both defined using this um, definition by case distinction. I just want to actually, well, never mind. Um, so to do that, actually, then I need to take that syntax away. Let's take the sorry away because we're going to, sorry means sorry, I'm not giving a proof, but I want to say sorry so I don't get an error. If I take the sorry away, then, uh, then, then we have an error because there's something incomplete there. So, of course, if we have a sorry there, um, it's still incomplete because there's no proof, but at least it doesn't interpret that as an error. It gives you a possibility of stating theorems that are true without proving that you want to say are true without, without proving them. But here we want to tidy up by actually proving everything. So let's prove this. Um, so our first, we want to make a case distinction on, we want to prove for all lists, A's, lists of A's and lists of B's, we want to prove this statement about length in the concatenation function. So because the concatenation function is defined um, depending on what the first argument of the concatenation function is, which is our a's in this case, um, we're going to do the case distinction as in the concatenation function. So we're first going to prove this statement in the case that a's is nil. So in the case that we have nil and and any b's, then our proof is going to be the following. Now, how are we going to prove this? Well, if a's are nil, then, well, if we concatenate nil onto b's, that's just b's. So we're saying that the length of the b's is the length of nil plus the length of b's, but length of nil is zero. So that's that zero plus the length of b's, and that's the length of b's. So that's a very fast chat through this, the proof that we're going to give. Doesn't it? It doesn't matter if you didn't follow that. But the first step in it was that we we instantiate a's with nil, and we want to say that the concatenation of nil with b's is b's. So, um, so that's given by this definition here, concatenate nil with b's is b's. Um, and we're then doing a chain of equalities, and there's a keyword calc, which says we're going to now calculate using a chain of equalities. So I'm going to indent a bit because I'm now inside the calc. And what we do is we, we want to start with the left-hand side, of the equation that we're trying to prove and end with the right hand side. So the left hand side is length of the concatenation of the a's with the b's, but a's are now nil, so we don't write a's, we write bill, we write nil. So the length of, well, let's copy it over. We're going to put nil in here. So this is equal to, well, we want to show that this is equal to the length, length of the b's.
Notice the red dotted underline is saying we still haven't finished proving this theorem, so we're not we're not there yet. And of course, concat nil with bees is indeed bees because of this definition here of the of the concatenation function. But we need to give um, we need to tell lean why it's the case, and it's the case by the reflexive constant that tells us that an equality is true. So if we go back to the notes, where we considered equality types, uh, identity types, I said we've got the reflexive constant that tells us that an equality, that any term is equal to itself. Now, but that term wasn't itself. But, it didn't, well, sorry, in the proof we were giving, it did not look like we were proving that a, an expression was equal to itself. But actually, we are because of this substitution rule here. So we're in a case where we can compute one of the sides, and the two sides, well, we can compute both of the sides, but with one we can't do anything. With the other side we compute it, both reduce to the same thing, and so Lean can see that this is indeed an instance of the reflexivity. So let's go back to Lean. That might not have been so clear to you what that meant, but let me explain it here. So the point is, this term here, Lean can compute that using the rules for computing the concatenation function given here. It computes that the concatenation of nil with b's is just b's. So it computes this down to length b's, and so indeed, once both sides have been computed, this is an instance of the reflexivity. So we're justifying this as an instance of reflexivity. Let's give ourselves a bit more space here. Um, so to continue with the proof from here, we want to continue reasoning. So we've got that this is equal to length of b's. So this is saying, the dot dot dots is saying, we're continuing to show that this, from this, this is equal to this. And so continuing with the chain of reasoning, that's equal to the next thing we're going to show. So we now want to go via, this is the same thing as zero plus the length of the b's, because the point is this is now length of nil, and we're going to show we want to, um, length of nil is zero. So here we want to show that length of b's is, so some number is equal to zero plus that number. Actually, if the zero had been on the right of the plus, Lean would have done this by computation, and that would be an example of the, ref the reflexive rule, at least I think it would, I haven't checked that. Um, but in this case, we need a lemma, and we need to know what that lemma is. So this is something in the library. So we get, so this is by rewriting according to a lemma in the library, which means use some equality in the library rather than computing it. And the particular equality is called nat. It's in the nat natural numbers library, and it's called zero add. So it's the identity that says, let's go to the notes. Um, where are they? So so I'm just writing miscellaneous stuff on this line. So zero add proves the equality Actually, I don't know which way around it is, but uh, n equals 0 plus n, or perhaps it's the other way around. For our purposes, it doesn't really matter. But certainly the 0 is on the left. OK, so we've got that this is 0 plus length of b's, and of course 0 is length of nil, and that's something that can be computed via the rules for computing the length function. The length of nil is zero, that's given above. So that's going to be an instance of the reflex of the reflexivity. So this is going to be equals length of nil plus length of b's. 
And that concludes that case. So we've finished this case because we've got from the left hand side instantiating a's as nil to the right hand side instantiating a's as nil. Um, so now the more interesting case is when the a's is not nil but it's rather a cons. The other interesting case for a list is when it's a a list consisting of one element a, little a, concatenated onto a tail list of, of, of a's. So in this case, so this is the case of, I need my bracket, of cons a a's, and again, b's can be arbitrary. So in this case, we're going to define the proof to be as follows. So again, we're going to do it by calculating from the left hand side to the right hand side. So in this case, now the left hand side, let's again copy it over and we need to replace, we need to replace the, the A's with, which was an arbitrary list with, it needs to be a list of the form that has Ahead, so it's a list of the form con a cons down to a's, and we have another one here, so we do that. And we want to prove sorry, we don't need the right, we want to work our way to the right hand side. Um, so here we've got the length of the concat of the argument we, we wanted. Our a's is now a cons down to a tail. And again, we want to work with this as before. So again, the concatenation function on a cons list, um, we can compute that. Oh, sorry, let's... Uh... So again, we can compute that if we concatenate a, an interesting list onto Bs here, then, um, so we concatenate an interesting list onto Bs, then that is cons A concat A's Bs. So, so we, we get here the length of, the result of this concatenation, the res result of this whole concatenation is cons A on concat a's, b's. Okay, so that's by the definition of the concat function gives us this case here. So again, this is by re the reflexivity. And we continue from the left hand side then showing that this, so now we've got the length of a function that's cons on to, sorry, the length of a list that contains the element a, so of a, of a non-trivial list that has a head element. So the length of such an element is the length of the inner thing plus one. So this is now the length of the of the inner thing, which is concat A's B's. Plus one. So this is so this is again by reflexivity. Because once again the two this side computes down using the using that this time the definition of the length function to this side. Um, so in fact, we could presume that we could probably miss out the second step here because this should immediately compute down, should, should not immediately, but in two steps compute down to this. So one might try that, but I'm realizing the lecture's been going on for quite some time. So let's not try that. You can try it yourself if you like. 
Um, okay, so now, the, what can we say about the length of the, this concatenated list here? Well, our theorem tells us that we're, we're trying to prove that the length of a concatenated list is the length of the A's plus the length of the B's. Now, the point is we're proving this by induction. We proved it for the empty list, and here we're proving it for a non-empty list, so that has some length, length n, say, which is strictly greater than zero. If, sorry, here, so the a's, the, uh, the yeah, so here the A's has length, the left hand side has length, left hand argument has length n, which is strictly greater than zero because it has an element at the head of it. So if this list has length n, this, the list A's, has length n minus one. So if we're proving the equality of these lengths by induction on the length of n, or you can even Think of it as just induction on the structure of a list is another way of thinking of it. But, in, but one way of thinking of it is by induction on the length of the list. Proving by induction, it's perfectly reasonable for us to use the equality that we've got in the statement of the theorem, because that's our induction hypothesis. So this, we can say this is the length of A's plus the length of B's plus 1. And this is by rewriting, again, using a, an assumed equality. And the equality here is length concat. It's the theorem that we're stating, because it's the equality that's stated in our theorem. OK, now we've got to this stage. We need to see that this is the length of, that this is the, we, we want to get that this is the length of A's plus the length of B's, where A's is actually um, cons, cons A A's. Um, so the length of this is, of course, the length of the inner A's plus one. It would have been better maybe if I would called them A's prime or something, but anyway. Um, so, so we need to move the, the one around. And this again, moving the one around is, um, we can justify this again by something in the natural numbers library. So in this case, we need rewriting with nat in the natural numbers library we've got nat suck add and i think suck add let's write that it says that one plus n is the same as n plus one At least I think so. I don't want to go into the library itself. It's something similar to that anyway. And it allows us to make this step. Um, and now, sorry, this should of course be the length of A's plus one. The length of a's plus 1 is, by the definition of the length function, we go back to it, is the same as the length of the constructed list a's a's. So now we can get that this is the same as the constructed list cons of a a's. So that's that part, plus length of b's. 
and this is again by reflexivity because now if we compute this the length of the cons of a's of a's by the definition of the length function it gives us exactly length of a's plus one so it computes to that side and we have now finished but there seems to be some some error here uh, so let me hover over it so some colon expected somewhere um, Ah, oh, the by shouldn't be there because, right, the point is the by is using some equality and uh, a, a, some equality from a library, um, whereas here we're actually giving the inhabitant of the equality. So we're giving the element of the equality type. So that but that doesn't seem to have completely solved the problem. Well, these are the these are the issues with um live aha I know I finished I missed out the reason here right there we go so the error messages could be more helpful in I mean, maybe it was actually telling me that a, a colon was missing but I couldn't see where it was um, the error messages could be more helpful uh, but actually I'm not very familiar with lean I only I only um, installed it a couple of days ago. So I'm sure you will have your own fun with error messages too. Anyway, we've now completed the proof. Let's just say perhaps one thing to say about this proof. Um, having done this, notice that we didn't actually need to say we were proving it by induction. Um, we know we're proving it by induction and lean knows that too and so it's kind of nice that you don't need to say it but lean is doing something a little bit clever behind the scenes because um of course we have to be very careful if we prove a theorem so we're proving this length of the concatenated lists is the sum of the lengths uh, we have to be very careful if we prove a theorem using the theorem itself i mean we don't want to give a a, a meaningless circular proof of course inductive proofs are exactly a way in which you can do that. You can use the theorem, the statement you're trying to prove in simpler cases that have already been established than the case that you're currently working on. So Lean is clever enough to work out that when we used length concat in the proof, that's the statement equality we're trying to prove, that we're actually using that in a simpler case than the case we were that, that, that we're working on. So Lean is very clever ah, in that respect. Okay, so one last thing is to look at uh, an example of a more interesting dependent type. So here we have a type of lists, again, but I'm calling them vectors because now it's a, a dependent type and this is now the type of vectors as introduced in the lecture. So if we go to the notes, well I had it earlier on in the lecture, but here 
we're going to have so that using the using properly the uh, lean notation so vector of natural numbers zero is again um, list of natural numbers of length zero of length zero and in our case in the in the lean notation that we're giving it we write that so there's only the empty vector so we're calling them vectors or lists, but the point is, as opposed to a list which the type of list has flexible length, this list of vectors are all those, essentially, it's all those lists of natural numbers that have exactly the length we're giving. And here the length is zero, um, the vector n2, for example, is lists of natural numbers of length Two. So an example of that would be cons um, five, cons seven, nil. So we're still using the same notation for lists as as we're doing before, but we notice that when we go to lean, um, where is lean here? Emacs. When we go to lean, so still using vectors and and cons, um, that now we're defining rather than so rather than giving ourselves just a type, a vector for a type A, for example, the type of natural numbers, then requires another argument, which is the length, and given the length, we get back the actual type. So for example, vector natural numbers 0 then is the actual type, or vector natural numbers 3 is the actual type. And again, once we've here, because we've got the type A to the left hand side of the colon, that's implicit in the definition. So nil is giving us vectors of elements of type A that have zero length. And for the cons, we need to build in the fact that if we cons, in order to cons an element, little a of type big A, onto a vector of type n, we get back a vector, sorry, a vector of length n. Again, the type A is implicit here because it's it was on the left-hand side of this colon here. Then we get back a vector of length n plus one. So we see how building a, what we call a, a, natural number parameter into the type family. So we're building the type dependency of vectors on a natural number by defining the vector constructor as it maps a natural number to a type. The vector A constructor maps a natural number to a type. And then the cons works in this way that changes the length parameter of the type of vectors we're dealing with. And once we've done that, we can again define the concatenation function. And so now, if we want to concatenate two vectors, well, it's a bit more interesting because we can't simply define the function without giving the information about the length. So we have to build in the fact, in order to define concatenation of vectors, we have to build in the fact that the concatenation is the sum, the, the length of a concatenation is the sum of the lengths of the component vectors into the type of concatenation itself. Because if we concatenate a vector of length m with a vector of length n, then in order to get a vector back, we need to say what length it will be, and the appropriate length for giving that is vector m plus n. And this works for any m and n in the natural numbers. So we're giving ourselves a function that takes 
any m and n in the natural numbers and provides us with a function from vectors of length m to and vectors of length n to vectors of the sum length. So here we have an interesting example of a dependent product. Okay, so to define this, again we would define this function by pattern matching. So again we define concatenation if the first argument is nil and then we've got an arbitrary y which is the vectors which is the second argument. But now if the first argument is nil, we also, so we, we also need to define concatenation it's also taking as arguments the natural numbers arguments that we're giving it. So if, nil, if the first argument vector argument is nil, the length has to be zero and the length of y can be anything. So if, if all its arguments together, the m, the n, the vector of length m and the vector of a n, if they're, if, if they're zero, a, number, a length n for the vector of length n, nil and y, which is the vector of length n, then of course the concatenation of that is y. So we would like to just say y here, but the problem is y at this point, so if we go back to the notes, y at this point, its type is, um, let's go back to Emacs, the type of y is vector a n. Well, that's the type of y. That y is this fourth argument here. We've got m, that's, that's zero, n, nil, which is this. And the type of y is vector a n. So, um, so y has vector A n, but we want but concat zero n nil y needs to have type vector a zero plus n. Sorry. Should be round brackets. Oh well it doesn't matter what kind of brackets they are really, but anyway, it's um so what Lean knows is that what was the type we're giving to concat here oops that's the wrong thing we don't want tech. The the type we're giving to concat is supposed to have vector a's m plus n. So it's supposed to have zero, plus, so m is zero here, so it should have vector a's zero plus n. Of course, zero plus n we know is equal to n, but we can't simply give y here because there's some reasoning that needs to be done. So the begin end tells us to do the reasoning that we need to do. So again, we need to use the nat zero add, um, equation, the same equation we used before, we need to rewrite by that and then the exact answer we can give is y because um, because we did want to give the value y, this is just justifying because this equation that 0 plus n equals n is justifying that y has the right type. And we have a similar um, need to reason, for, so it's exactly the same for the other argument to concatenation. So the point is, in order to type the function here when we've got a, the dependent type is giving us the type itself contains the length of the vectors. This is useful for various reasons. For example, one can use it to define matrices, the types of matrices. A little bit on that is done in the exercise, in the homework exercises. But in order to deal with that, it's a little bit more complicated, well, maybe quite a bit more complicated to write the program. But when we've written the program, we don't then need to go through the proof that concatenating two vectors, the length of concatenating two vectors is the sum of the lengths, because that's already built into the type of the program itself. So there's no need to do this long 
So we've got a little bit more work in defining the program, but there's no need to do this kind of proof because it's already built into the program itself. OK, so that was quite a long second half of the lecture. Um, after a very long first half of the lecture, as I said, we're having more, as I think I said in the email, we're having more material in the lecture videos this week because there isn't going to be a lecture next week. The idea is to set you up so that if you do want to try to do this exercise, you're in a position to do that over the, over the next week. And there will be the Zoom session with Egbert on Wednesday next week to help you with that. So I hope you can basically take your time going through the previous video and this one, and this is going to be helpful getting you going in the homework exercises. And uh, I shall be in contact with you uh, in two weeks time when we shall have a, a short Zoom session to discuss the um, assessment of the course and in particular the exam. OK, so that's plenty of material for this week. I wish you well with the exercises. I hope you're all staying well and uh, that's bye for now.